If you would go ahead and turn your Bibles over to Psalm chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be flipping around a lot tonight. Um, and we'll be to Psalms 1 in just a moment. But uh, I would like to begin with a prayer, if you would bow with me. Holy Father, we again come to you and we are thankful for another opportunity like this to be able to meet together as a family. God, we are thankful for the privilege to be able to dig into your scripture together. And God, I pray that uh, tonight, as we conclude our series on living a life that matters, that you open our hearts um, to hear what you have to say and that you give us the humility to grow in the ways that we need to grow, God. Holy Father, we are, we are so thankful for your son. We are thankful for his example that he gave to us on living a life that truly has meaning. And I pray that you continue to transform us into his image, God. I pray that you mold us into the image of your son so that the when the world sees us as individuals and sees us as a community, that they may know that you love them and that you sent your Son for them. Holy Father, it's through his name that we pray. Amen. So uh, tonight we're going to con- conclude our series on living a life that matters. Um, uh, I thought it would be a good idea to use this time for really two purposes. One, I wanted to go really take a a, a panoptic snapshot of each uh, lesson that we've gone over the past uh, quarter and uh, to do an overview of the entire series followed by the conclusion in our last topic. So uh, if you can remember all the way back to the beginning of the series when Sidney began our study, he he began with a a really big question, a really reflective question. And, um, And that question was, what would happen tomorrow if you were gone? All right. What would happen tomorrow if you're gone? Maybe you moved out of the neighborhood you live in, or perhaps you left a, a certain place of employment. Um, but what if you what if you left this congregation? What would happen if you were gone tomorrow? Would people notice? Would people realize that you're gone? How would they respond to your absence? Would they be glad that you're gone? Would they be relieved that you're gone? Would they miss you? What, what, what would their response be? And, and I really think that this type of question forms our thoughts when we, when we approach a topic like living a life that matters. Um, are, we, are we really living a life that has meaning? And I remember speaking with Sidney before the class, before this quarter began, and, and I was just telling him how, how big of a topic this really is to me, living a life that matters. Because I, I struggle with just living a day that matters or living a, a moment that has meaning. You know, what does it mean to live a life that matters? You see, living a life that matters is living day by day with meaning. Are we living each day with intentionality to make a good impact on the people around us? And each one of these topics serves as a foundational characteristic to living a life. That matters. So if you would turn to Psalms chapter 1, we're going to be flipping around a lot. Um, we're going to read Psalms 1, 1 through 2. We begin with the topic, living virtuously. One who is virtuous is one who has high moral standards. Psalm 1, 1 through 2 says this, if you would follow along with me. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. So this is where our journey began, all right? Our starting point for living a life that matters is observing where we walk. Living virtuously is living a life that has high expectations, and has high standards for morality. Okay, so we don't walk in the path of wicked people. We don't stand where sinners stand. And we don't sit where scoffers sit. Our gaze, okay, our eyes are fixated on God and His law. It's on His, it's on this that we meditate day and night. Virtue is where we began our journey. And then we, when then we turn to living courageously, if you would turn over to Psalm chapter 27, Psalm 27, please uh, turn with me. 
Psalm 27, verse 14 says this. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Living a life that matters is one where we draw strength and we draw courage from God. So when we approach life and we approach its difficulties, we must have courage to do the hard things that we need to do. Living a life that matters is not easy. It's not the easy decision. It's not the natural decision. It's the hard anti-cultural lifestyle that defines Christianity, and in it, we must, learn, we must lean on God to give us the strength to live each day with meaning. If you were to turn over to Acts chapter 4, we see in Acts 4, um, after uh, Peter and John healed the lame beggar in chapter 3, and then they were in prison, and when they were released in chapter 4, starting in verse 23, we read a really powerful prayer. All right, so starting in verse 23 and following, it says this, Acts 4. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, and this is what they prayed, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan have predestined to take place. Now pay attention. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. What a beautiful example, right, of the early church uh, under heavy persecution and fear lift their hearts and they lift their worries to the Lord to petition him for courage. We then turn and we, we began to look at the concept of living sacrificially. Psalm chapter 51. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verses 16 and verses 17. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Jesus is our greatest example of a perfect sacrifice. Um, you see, his sacrifice was not fully defined by his action of submissiveness to the cross. Uh, of course, his sacrifice was fully realized in his death, and it was fully realized in his resurrection, but the life that Jesus lived was one that was sacrificial, okay? You see, Jesus lived every single moment with a broken and a contrite heart, and this was not because he had guilt over sin, because he was blameless, but this, this is the attitude of humility that Jesus approached life with. His life, his day, and every moment was sacrificial to the needs of the people around him. Living a life that matters is one that lives sacrificially, that looks to the needs of others over the needs of yourself. Then we turn to Psalm chapter 92. And this is where we, we, did, we covered the subject of living joyfully. Living a life that matters is one that is joyful. So Psalm chapter 92, verses 1 through 2, and then verse 4. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the Lord and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the work of your hands. 
So the actions of the Lord, what the Lord has done, results in our joy. Right? We rejoice at His handiwork, both in His creation and in His salvation. What God has done should radically affect our attitude towards life. God works. God's work gives us joy and meaning. It completely shapes our attitude in the way that we approach the difficulties of life and the way that we approach um, the people around us. Living a life that matters is one that is gracious. We are to live graciously. If you remember the parable of the two debtors in Luke 7, we see an example of a man being forgiven a large debt. And even though he received this huge blessing, and even though this man received this great forgiveness of this great debt, uh, he still showed no grace to the little debt that was owed to him. In Psalm 130, if you would flip over there, verses 3 through 4 says this. Psalm 130. Verses 3 through 4 says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. The Lord's grace spurs us to be gracious to others. We live gracefully because we are shown grace. And if we don't live gracefully, then we may not fully understand and we may not fully appreciate the level in which He has shown grace to us. So just like the, the parable of the two debtors, um, when we fully understand who we are in, in God's eyes and what we have done in God's eyes and, and, and at the length that He has gone to, sh- to show grace to us transforms the way that we see grievances against us. So when we see God's salvation and His grace shown upon us, we see then more clearly how little these things that we have against other people. And we find it easier to be gracious. Next, we are to live reverently. If you would turn over to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. Hebrews 5, verse 7. This verse, I believe, has um, shaped my prayer life in a very drastic way over the past year. Or two, um, Hebrews 5, verse 7 says this, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard, okay, listen to me, and he was heard because of his reverence. All right? So it's really easy for us, I think, it's really easy for me to, to when, I, when I look at Jesus' example and when I look at Jesus' prayer life and, and his walk with the Lord, it's really easy to just assume that, Jesus had an in with God. He was the Son of God. He, he came from heaven, and so his prayers were a little bit more special than, than mine. But what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 5-7 is that the Lord listened to Jesus. Okay? The Lord listened to Jesus because of his reverence, because of his piety, because of his respect. And if that doesn't shape your prayer life, I don't know what will. All right? Hebrews 5-7 it shows us that we must approach God with reverence and with humility. And in the same book, as we saw in the fall quarter, there's several passages that encourage us that we are allowed to approach the throne with confidence, right? We are allowed to approach the throne with boldness, not because of who I am, because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus did on the cross and because of how he has transformed me. But that must be held in tandem with a reverent attitude, so living a life with meaning is one that lives reverently and respectfully to who's, who God is in his position and who I am in respect to him. Okay? Living reverently. And then we, we looked over to living triumphantly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, we're going to read verses uh, 54 through 56. And Paul says this, starting in verse 54. 
when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So like we discussed um, when this topic came a few weeks ago, living victoriously is, has nothing to do with the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Uh, you, you might hear people say phrases like that all they need to do when, when the hard time comes, when the valley comes, when the struggle comes, when whatever persecution comes, whenever hard thing comes my way, when the storm comes, all you have to do is to speak victory over said thing, and then God will be victorious and make it all better. But you see, living victoriously, as far as the New Testament is concerned, is not about comfort here. Living victoriously is living triumphantly over sin and death. Christ overcame the world. And that's what he promised his disciples before he left. And, and John, take heart, I have overcome the world. And in 1 John, we see we, we participate in that victory, in that overcoming of the world by being consumed within the cross of Christ. Living triumphantly. And because of this, the way we live day to day is completely changed. We live with energy and we live with zeal that comes from our victory over sin. In Romans 6.11, one of the biggest points we made that day is that after he, he introduces Romans chapter 6, verses 1 uh, through 3, he talks about how when we were baptized, we were baptized into his death, we were buried therefore into his burial and we were raised in a, in, to walk in a new, way of li, a new way of walking. And then he talks about how the cross of Christ was sufficient. He doesn't come back year by year. His death was sufficient. Likewise, in Romans 6.11, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. All right? This is not a suggestion. Right? This is not a request. This is a command. You must consider yourselves dead. Why? Because God said so. But, but I don't, I still, you know, I still have this thing going on. I, I still really struggle. It doesn't matter, okay? We are continually being sanctified. We are continually being set apart and being transformed. And that is this tension that we will live with until we die and until we are fully real, realized into his glory. But until then, we have to, in one hand, realize that we are not perfect but in the other hand, realize that we are perfect. You see, Christianity is this great paradox, this great inaugurated eschatology where we realize that the, the end times, the end benefits of being a Christian are, fully, are not yet fully consummated, but are inaugurated now. So I am saved, and I will be saved. I am justified, and I will be justified. I am sanctified now, and I will be sanctified now. Right? So we are to live victoriously. We are declared righteous because God has the power and the ability to do that. Sin still exists. That tension still exists. But we have to submit ourselves to trust God that when He says you are righteous, that He means what He says. And then we allow that statement, that declaration to transform our attitude towards life. Understanding who God says we are and the way that God views us allows us to live victoriously because then we know that we truly are saved. So that when someone asks you, are you, are you going to heaven when you die? You don't have to worry about your answer. Not because of pride in yourself, but because of pride in the Lord. Living victoriously. Then we turn to Proverbs chapter 3, and we discuss living trustfully. Proverbs 3.
We're going to read verses 5 through 6. Solomon says this, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. So when life gets hard, all right, when that storm comes, as we said, and we, we looked back at uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and after the, after the Lord was done teaching, he says that a wise man will build his house upon the rock, and the foolish man will build his house on the stand. But it is imperative for the Christian to understand, no matter where you build your house, okay, no matter if you build it on the rock, no matter if you build it on the sand, the storm is going to come either way. And we get trapped into this false mentality that if I do the right thing, right, if I go to church every Sunday, morning, night, and Wednesday night, so three times a week, if I do those things and if I don't cuss and I don't drink and I don't whatever fill in the blank and we, we have this checklist that we just got to fill out and check out, that if I do the right things, right, that I'll be okay, that nothing hard is going to come my way. And then when something hard does come, something hard that just doesn't make any sense, then we have the audacity to turn back to the Lord and say, what did I do to deserve this? Why are you doing this to me? Don't you see? I mean, I didn't do this thing. The only rated R movie I saw was Passion of the Christ, and that's acceptable, okay? I did all these things, and I didn't do all these things, and I... That's, that's making a God out of morality. That's not serving our God. The storm's going to come either way. And I don't want us to get trapped in this mindset that if we do the right things, life's not going to be hard. Because Jesus promises the opposite, right? When he calls his disciples, he says, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, right? If you want to come after me, deny yourself, pick up the cross. Pick up the symbol of death and follow me because life's going to be hard. Life's going to be hard, especially for the Christian. So what are we going to do when that storm comes? Well, Solomon says that we are to trust. We are to lean on his, own, on his understanding. Not on our own understanding, on his understanding. And we're to acknowledge him in all of our ways. One of the key points that we made about living trustfully was that at the end of our study, we said that living trustfully is, is one of those things that is experiential. At the end of the day, you can look for guidance. You can look for, you know, for the Lord to lead you through a hard time. Um, and you, you, can pre you can prepare yourself to a certain degree. But when the storm hits and when life just doesn't make sense, trusting God is something that comes through experience. And it is... Trusting the Lord is intrinsically woven within a relationship, a pre-existent relationship with the Lord. So if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, when that storm comes, you're not going to be able to battle the storm. You have no foundation to stand on. You have no rock to stand on, right? So trusting the Lord is one that falls back on a relationship that you have built over time and is experiential and is difficult. The storm will come. We are to trust the Lord. We are to lean on someone who has perfect understanding of the situation. And then at the end of the day, we are to acknowledge Him in everything that we do and say. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. Living humbly serves as the cornerstone of all of our characteristics when it comes to living a life that matters. So Proverbs Chapter 3, verse 34 says this, Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. Nothing throws God's order into chaos more than pride. C.S. Lewis talks about in mere Christianity how, how pride is 
Every sin can be rooted back to pride. And if you think about it, that's true. Everything that you can look at, every sin that you can look at, really at the end of the day comes back to elevating myself over everyone else and over the Lord. And that's why humility throughout the Scriptures is spoken about so often. And we look at Nebuchadnezzar, and, and when he starts to elevate himself and look at, all, look at all that I have made and all that I have done with the work of my hands, God says, sit down, son, eat grass. You know, like, he doesn't have time for pride because pride just ruins everything. See, humility is the most important characteristic there is to both knowing God and, and being faithful as a Christian. Humility was the face of Christ's life. Philippians 2 makes it clear um, after he encourages them in verses 1 through 4 to not consider yourselves more important than others, but to humble yourselves and look to the needs of others. And then he, and then he hinges it to the perfect example in verse, uh, in verse 5. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. All right, so he transitions to the perfect example of Christ. And he says, who did not consider equality a thing to be grasped, a thing to be attained, a thing to be, you know, equality with God was not at the forefront of Christ's mind. His desire was to submit himself. And through the, rest of, through the, the next few verses in Philippians 2, you see this lowering. Who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but lowered himself to the point of a man, to the point of a servant, to the point of death, even death on a cross. And because of this continual lowering and the continual humility that Christ displayed, the Lord elevated him and glorified him again. But Christ, in everything that he said and everything that he did, and when you look at the, the way that Jesus lives his life and the way that he interacts with other people, Humility was the cornerstone for the way that he behaved, the way that he didn't consider his needs more important than other people's needs. And we understand this as a general concept. If I asked you, is humility important for the Christian? You'd say yes. But humility is incredibly difficult, at least in my opinion, incredibly difficult to, to remember and to, to live out in the moment, right? For me, I, I, I don't know about you, but for me, I... I I struggle less with the big pride problems. I struggle more with the little pride problems, you know, the, the little instances where I just don't really want to do that right now, well, you know, and, and showing humility in a conversation with a coworker or, or showing humility in a conversation with a family member um, or, or, you know, doing something I don't necessarily want to do. Christ always lived humbly, and he didn't make it about himself, and that's fully realized when he went to the cross. Humility. We're also to live wisely. In Proverbs chapter 8. Just turn a page or two over. In Proverbs 8, we'll read verses 10 through 11. Solomon says this, Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. Living a life that matters is living in a way where you approach every single decision with wisdom. What is the best decision that I can make in this given moment? What's going to be best for not just me, but for my family, for my friends, and ultimately for God's kingdom? Approaching life with wisdom discerning your actions, not just saying whatever comes off the top of your head, not just doing whatever comes off you know, top of your mind, just approaching life with wisdom. I mean, what, what would your life look like if you really prayed for wisdom like we're told to pray in James? What would it look like if, if every single decision you came your way, you asked the Lord, Lord, help me make the wisest decision that I can in this moment? What would it look like? Where would you be? Last week, we talked about living generously. If you would, uh, 1 Corinthians 8 9. This was really our, our launch pad for our talk last week. 1 Corinthians chapter 8.
Paul says this. Let's see. I think I got the wrong verse here. It might be 2 Corinthians 8 9. Let me look. I bet you that's it. There it is. 2 Corinthians 8 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And this is the where he starts. This is really the, the, the foundation for this chapter and the next chapter to come when he's encouraging them to give, when, he, when he's to collect for the Christians in Jerusalem, for the famine in Jerusalem, all right? He, he appeals to a greater example that though Christ was, and he uses the word rich and poor, and we saw in Philippians 2, we were talking about equality with God and then a servant. The same thing is in view here. This verse frames for us how to, to live generously, you see, it's so much more than just tossing a check and a plate on a Sunday morning. Uh, living generously is living a lifestyle that is giving incarnationally, all right? So in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, we see that though he was rich, he became poor. That is the, the word becoming flesh in John 1. Though he was equal with God, he became a servant. Though he was the word of God who was intricately involved in the creation of the world, John 1, 1. He became flesh, and he tabernacled among us, right? So when we look at the way Jesus gave, not just on the cross, not just on that day, but the way that he gave in his life in general, it, it, it gives us a perfect example of how to give. It's so much more than just tossing the check in the plate. It's so much more than just, you know, handing the dollar to the homeless man but, and looking away at the same time. You see, Jesus, when he gave, his giving was relational. So when Jesus gave of himself, he was talking with people. He was eating with people. He was ministering to people. He was sharing the good news with people. I remember when I was in South Africa, a, a, my, my coordinator told me that, I forget exactly how he phrased it, but he said, I when, I hand, when you hand a dollar to a homeless man or five dollars to a homeless man or whatever and you don't look him in the eye, you've missed the whole point of the dollar. You see, everything that we have been given, everything that we have been blessed with is given to us to connect us to other people so that we can share the good news with other people. That's why Jesus fed people. The crowd comes to him and he says, I know you're only here for food. What does he do? He feeds them anyway because he understands that meeting these physical needs is the key to meeting the spiritual needs. Meeting physical needs creates a pathway to the heart of the sinner. Are you with me? So living generously is one that's so much more than just writing a check and being distant. So here, when, when you give, are you involved in where your money goes? Are you involved with the work of the church? Are you involved in your community? Because if not, then you're cutting it short and you're missing the point. Which brings us to our last topic tonight, which I will, I will use as just a brief conclusion um, for our study as a whole. And it's titled, Living Expeditiously. Living expeditiously is living with speed and efficiency. And this may, this may seem like an odd topic uh, to end on, but upon a closer look, I, I do think that it will serve us well. And so if you would, we were here a couple of weeks ago, but I want to end here tonight. Turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes 12. So at the end of Solomon's life, um, I would like to zoom in and, and uh, point out uh, the way he concludes 
his observations of life. Um, you know, he chased everything. When we, we looked at passages that said he chased wisdom and he, and he chased money and he chased women and he chased work and he chased whatever. And at the end of the day, it was just vain. Or some versions say meaningless, right? It was absolutely nothing. It was pointless. It was meaningless. Everything he chased after was like chasing wind. And the key phrase in the whole book that we looked at was under the sun. Everything he chased under the sun was vain, was meaningless. And then he concludes in verse 13 of chapter 12, the end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. So for Solomon, life only has meaning, all right? Life only matters when we look above the sun. When we look above the sun and we fear God and we keep His commandments and we, we look at what does God want. And that's what all of these different things we've been talking about week to week all boil down to is looking above the sun, when you live with wisdom, when you live humbly, when you live, these are all against what the world says to do, right? These are all under the sun. We are to look above the sun. Generosity is above the sun. Humility is above the sun. Living trustfully is above the sun. Fear God. Keep His commandments. This is when we find meaning. So for God and God alone can give your life meaning and purpose. And if you try and you take any of these topics and you make it about yourself and you just try to muster up the ability to do it on your own, you will fail. You see, this is about God. All this is about God. This is about God and His purpose and His work in you and His work through you. And as Paul says in Philippians 1.6, I am sure of this, that He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Only God can give you purpose, and only God can complete the work in you. Only God can give you meaning. God alone can allow for your life to matter. God's the only one who has the ability that at the end of the day, when you're gone, that people will say, man, what a godly man, what a godly woman. He says in verse 1 of this chapter, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. This is something that we can't put off. We have to do it now. We have to be expeditious. We have to shape our lives now. And if we try and we wait and we wait till later to give our life meaning and we just start chasing stuff, It'll be too late because we can't allow for the evil days, as the verse says, the hard times, the, the pains of life. We can't allow for them to come and draw us away from the Lord. We must fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man, and this is what it means to live a life that matters. Let's end with a prayer. Holy Father, we come to You again, and we are thankful for the opportunity you've given us just to dig into your word. Um, we're thankful for this series and we're thankful for the challenge that you've laid before us to live like your son. And so, Father, I would pray that you would take each one of these subjects and, and you help us to grow in them both as, as individuals and the way that we think, the way we talk to you and the way we talk about you and the way we talk to other people and the way we talk about other people. Father, I pray that whatever pride might be in the way and whatever, whatever comes in between us and our growth, I pray that you, you come swiftly and you shatter it. 
because God, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's about you, and we know that, and we are thankful to be called your children and your heirs, and we are thankful that you have decided to use us to advance your kingdom, but we know that this can only be done through transformation. And we pray that you continue to grow us and continue to transform us into the image of your perfect Son. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Thanks for your attention.